Hello, beautiful people. Today is Didn't Make Up the Mystery Saturday. If you're unaware what my Didn't Make Up the Mystery series is, it's where I sit down, um, apparently whenever I feel like it. <laughs> And I talk to you guys about whatever I feel like talking about that day, basically. And I'm going to be doing my makeup at the same time. Honestly, I feel like I should have called this series something like Random Saturday or something. Just because at this point, this series has kind of taken a turn and a mind of its own, which I'm not mad about. There are just so many things I want to talk about. So make sure to leave your suggestions for anything you would like to hear me talk about for the next episode of Didn't Make Up the Mystery. It can be murder it can be a conspiracy theory pretty much anything you want to hear me talk about just let me know in the comments and maybe your suggestion will be what i talk about next time now it has been a while since i've had one of these videos i think it's been about two months if you didn't know i decided that i wasn't going to be doing this series every week anymore just because it wasn't realistic for me at least not right now but i was supposed to have a new episode about a month ago a bunch of things happened it just wasn't in the cards apparently so i've got a different episode for you guys today and i have to say i'm actually pretty excited to be filming this not for the topic itself because it's a very depressing topic but just because it's been so long since i've actually had one of these fingers crossed it actually makes it up this time so we've waited long enough let's get right into today's episode of didn't make up the mystery so as I'm sure you could tell from today's title, we're going to be talking about the Lindbergh kidnapping. So if you don't know anything about the Lindbergh kidnapping, sit down, buckle up, because you're in for a story. Our story starts in Hopewell, New Jersey in 1932. A couple by the name of Charles and Anne Lindbergh live happily on their estate outside of Hopewell, New Jersey. They have a son named Charles Augustus Lindbergh Jr., that is a mouthful, was born on June 22nd in 1930. Charles Lindbergh Sr. was a aviator, an officer in the military, an author, an inventor, and an activist. When Charles was just 25 in 1927, he made history by winning the Ortigue Prize for making a non-stop flight from New York City to Paris. So that is why they're famous. <laughs> so then we're going to fast forward to March 1st, 1932. It's approximately 10 p.m. when Charles Jr.'s nurse, Betty Gao, discovers a little baby Charles is missing. He notices his mother doesn't have him and he's missing from his nursery. So at this point, Betty goes and tells Charles Sr. that she can't find baby Charles. So immediately, Charles Sr. jumps into action. Charles quickly discovers a ring some note in his son's nursery. So obviously at this point they know for sure he's been taken. He's not just missing, he's been taken. I will insert a picture of the ransom note here but you can't really read it so instead I'll read it for you. It says, Dear Sir, have $50,000 ready. $25,000 in $20 bills, $15,000 in $10 bills, and $10,000 in $5 bills. After two to four days we will inform you where to deliver the money. We warn you for making anything public or for notify the police. The child is in good care. Indication for all letters are signature in three holes. Then at the bottom of the note, there was two interconnected blue circles surrounding a red circle with a hole punched through the red circle and two more holes to the left and right. I don't know what the significance of that was. I kind of have a feeling that this note was meant to lead the family to believe that their son had been taken by multiple people more like a group or something not one person i don't think i don't think they wanted them to maybe believe it wasn't just one person responsible for this that's what i would take away from this note like the little circle things at the bottom that screams like this is our i don't know what do you call that our logo and then the use of the word we in there it just really feels like they're trying to make it seem like there's a lot of people involved in this you know which usually means it's one person. But again, I'm not an expert. So at this point, Charles grabbed a gun and him and his butler, Ollie, went out searching the property. And this is when they discovered shoe impressions 
on the ground under baby Charles's window. So baby Charles's nursery was on the second floor and they discovered shoe impressions under the window. They also found pieces of a wooden ladder as well as a baby blanket. So clearly he was taken from the window. After they discovered all these items below the window, the butler reports the kidnapping to the Hopewell police, who then called the New Jersey State Police and they were the ones who took charge of this investigation. So quickly, the Hopewell police as well as the New Jersey State Police began a search of the Lindbergh property. Like I said, they live on an estate. Like it's a, it, it's a massive area. It's going to take a minute to search it. Then the morning after the kidnapping, President Herbert Hoover was notified about baby Charles's kidnapping. Although at that time, kidnappings were classified as a state crime. So I'm assuming because the Lindberghs were such a high profile family that authorities just felt it necessary to alert the president because, you know, it's high profile. Duh. So they ended up coming to the conclusion that the case did not have any grounds for federal involvement and they left the New Jersey State Police in charge of the case. Then the attorney general at the time met with President Hoover and they announced that basically all of the federal Department of Justice would not necessarily get involved, but that they would be at the state's disposal. You know what I mean? So they weren't like sending the troops in, so to speak, already, but they said, anytime you need help, you need any any extra hands, let us know. We'll get you the help you need. At the time, the FBI was simply called the Bureau of Investigation, and they were authorized permission to actively invest the case. But on the back burner waiting for their call was the U.S. Coast Guard, the U.S. Customs Services, Immigration Services, and the Washington D.C. Police. They were all informed your services may be required, we're not really sure yet, but be ready to go basically. Then it was announced that there was a $25,000 reward being offered for the safe return of Little Lindy. In addition to the $25,000 being offered by the state, the Lindbergh family themselves themselves offered up an additional $50,000. All right, so let's talk about the money in this story so far. So the kidnappers asked for $50,000. The Lundberg family is offering $50,000 for the safe return of their baby. $50,000 in 1932 equates to approximately $1.4 million today. That is a lot of money. Back to the investigation. So they found traces of mud on the nursery floor, which is to be expected since they found that ladder below the window with the impressions in the mud. Clearly all signs are pointing to a window abduction. So the ladder that they believed was used to get up the window had like came into two different parts so to speak. They were able to determine that where the ladder went together it had broke right at the joint. So they believe that either going up the ladder or coming back down the ladder. I'm gonna assume going back down because otherwise the kidnapper probably would have tried to escape a different way but the ladder broke. Like I said I'm gonna assume when they were going down the ladder broke. The dude just decided to ditch it there because it's broken anyways. Why not? I've already kidnapped a baby. I might as well just leave my ladder behind. It's fine. But something that I find very odd in this case was the lack of, and yes, I know this is the 1930s, but the lack of evidence, the lack of forensic evidence. So it's the 1930s, right? You would expect fingerprints everywhere, everywhere in this nursery. No. There's none. The only fingerprints that they found in this nursery were those of little Lindy. I like baby Charles better. That's more fun to say. They found no blood stains, no fingerprints other than baby Charles's. That's hard to say. So then they had a fingerprint expert examine the ransom note as well as that ladder that was left behind. Once again, no usable fingerprints were found. They also couldn't find any usable footprints. Clearly, I cannot talk and do my brows at the same time, so give me a minute. So experts believe that the suspect probably wore gloves and had some type of cloth on their shoes, but I still think it's really weird that they didn't find any fingerprints anywhere in the nursery because even on the windowsill, where people admitted to touching the windowsill, yet they were unable to find any fingerprints, which makes me think that the windowsill had to have been wiped down between the time when 
baby Lundberg was taken and when the fingerprints were checked, I guess you could say, when they checked for fingerprints. That's the way to say that, yeah. So between those two periods of time, I think somebody had to have wiped down the, the windowsill. I mean, what other explanation is there? So obviously because, you know, things are looking a little suspicious, the household estate employees were quickly questioned and investigated, yet police couldn't find anything there. So at this point, Charles Lindbergh, who, like I said, is a man of means, he has a very prominent background. So he asked his friends to help him communicate with the kidnappers. So word very quickly spread of the kidnapping. And when that happened, hundreds of people converged upon the estate, which is not good because in doing so, they destroyed any footprint evidence that, that police had any hopes of finding. Like I said, big property and what little footprint evidence they found, they weren't able to do anything with it. So maybe if this kidnapper had taken a certain path to, into and out of the woods, maybe they would have been able to find it. But nope, once all these people came, yeah, that it did not go well. That just destroyed any hopes there. So a lot of the people that were showing up were what I would guess would be friends of the Lindberghs, specifically Charles. A bunch of military colonels were showing up, offering assistance and support in any way they could. Charles Lindbergh and his friends I don't even know what I was gonna say. Lindbergh and his colonel friends, they started theorizing that they suspected the kidnap was done by somebody in organized crime, but the ransom note suggested that it was written by somebody who spoke German as their native language. Five days after baby Charles was taken, a second ransom note was received. It arrived by mail at the Lindbergh home and it was postmarked from Brooklyn, New York, March 4th, and it had those same perforated red and blue marks. So clearly it's not a hoax, it's definitely the kidnapper. Kidnappers. And in this note, they increased the ransom from $50,000 to $70,000. So Charles's attorney took it upon himself to hire their own private investigative team, although nothing really came about that. So and then two days after the second note was received on March 8th, a third ransom note has been received. Like I said, they were trying to make contact with the kidnappers. So this is a good thing. This is what they wanted. Once again, this note came by mail, except this time it arrived to Charles's attorney, Henry Breckenridge. This note basically told them that the kidnappers did not want to meet in person, that they weren't ready for that yet because obviously they're going to try to get them to meet in person. They want the kid back and if they can meet up, essentially they'd be able to follow the kidnapper back to where wherever he or she is holding baby Charles. So the kidnapper didn't fall for that and they told the Lindberghs that instead they would like for them to communicate with the kidnapper through the newspaper. So if you're unaware back in the day you could put like a personal ad in the newspaper and you could communicate with people that way. And they also requested that a man by the name of Dr. John Condon should be the one that they're communicating with. They pick him as their go-between. They also requested that the Lindberghs would put in the newspaper that they did in fact receive the third note. They also gave them instruction, instructions specifying the size that the box the money should come in should be. And once again, they warned them not to contact police or family, which obviously they already have because, you know, they're pleading to you from the media. So clearly everybody already knows about this, but whatever. The same day that the third ransom note was received, Dr. John Condon, who was a well-known Bronx TV personality and a retired school principal, offered his own $1,000 reward if the kidnapper would turn the child over to a Catholic priest. The following day, the fourth ransom note was received by Dr. Condon himself this time. They indicated to him that he was acceptable as a go-between between them and the kidnappers and a Charles Sr. approved. He thought this was a good idea as well. So from now on, 
Dr. Condon is going to be the middleman in this case. Then on March 10th, they got the $70,000 in cash together for the ransom. Then they immediately started negotiations for payment through newspaper columns and Dr. Condon would sign off as Jaffsy so that way they would know it was him. Then on March 12th at approximately 8.30 p.m., Dr. Condon received an anonymous phone call. Then he received a fifth ransom note. This time, the note was delivered by a man named Joseph Perron. He was a taxi driver who claimed he received the note from an unidentified stranger. The fifth note contained details about how he could find the sixth note which the kidnapper had hidden beneath a stone at a vacant stand 100 feet from an outlying subway. The sixth note instructed Dr. Condon to go to Woodland Cemetery where he would then meet somebody who was calling himself by the name John. The two then discussed how they would go about paying the ransom. But before they got too much into that, <laughs> good old John decided he wanted to share his backstory with Dr. Condon. He claimed he was a Scandinavian sailor, that he was a part of a gang with three other men and two women. He claimed that the baby was being held on a boat but that he was unharmed and that he would be returned for the ransom money. At this point, Dr. Condon's kind of like, I don't know that I believe you. How am I just supposed to know that you have the baby? A lot of people know about the missing baby. You could just be trying to extort us. How do I know you're the real deal? So, John tells Dr. Condon that he's going to prove that he does in fact have a baby Charles. So John asks, how are you going to prove that? And he tells him he's going to send baby Charles sleep clothes, his, I'm assuming a onesie, the sleeping suit is what he called it, that I'm assuming Charles was in when he was taken. He told Dr. Condon that he was going to return that to them and this was going to be all the proof they would need to know he did in fact have baby Charles. Then he went on to ominously ask, would I burn if the package were dead? Dr. Condon tried to question him further, but John just like brushed it off. Oh no, the, the baby's fine. He's fine. He's fine. But that's very ominous. Why would you even question that if he is in fact fine? Suspicious. The two parted ways and on March 16th, sure enough, Dr. Condon received a toddler's sleeping suit by mail as well as the seventh ransom note. The Lindberghs were able to positively identify the baby clothing as being that of Charles and Dr. Condon continued with his ads in the paper. So you remember Betty Gao, baby Charles's nurse? Well, on March 29th, she found baby Charles's thumb guard which he had been wearing at the time of the kidnapping. So how did it get there? I really don't know. Um, I wasn't able to find a whole lot on this, but I find it very weird. So like, first of all, how has it been 28 days and you're just now finding this by the front doors? Um, how? Just how? I just don't understand how it just miraculously showed up by the front doors 28 days after baby Charles went missing. Weird, right? Please tell me I'm not the only one that thinks that's extremely suspicious. The next day, Dr. Condon received the ninth ransom note, threatening to increase the ransom demand to $100,000. On April 1st, Dr. Condon received the 10th ransom note that instructed him to have the money ready for the following night. Dr. Condon responded to this note using an ad in the press. And then on April 2nd, the 11th ransom note was delivered to Dr. Condon by an unknown taxi driver. This man said he received it from an unknown man. Same story as the last time. Once again, this note instructed him where to find the 12th note and he found that note under a stone in front of a greenhouse in the Bronx. On that same night, Dr. Condon followed the instructions in that 12th ransom note and he once again met with who he believed to be John. He informed John that they were only able to raise $50,000 for the ransom. The man accepted the money and gave Dr. Condon the 13th ransom note. This note stated that baby Charles was in the care of two innocent women and it gave instructions basically saying that baby Charles could be found on a boat called Nellie near Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. The day after Dr. Condon met with 
John. An unsuccessful search for baby Charles was made at Martha's Vineyard and the search was later repeated with the same results. At this point, Dr. Condon was positive that if he were to see John again, he would definitely be able to recognize him. Though, according to his own statements, John had stayed in the shadows and tried to obscure his face as much as possible so plus we all know how tricky the human eye is so I don't believe he'd be able to identify him if he saw him again but you never know. Sadly on May 12th 1932 a delivery truck driver by the name of Orville Wilson and his assistant William Allen pulled to the side of the road about four and a half miles south of the Lindbergh home and William Allen got out. William Allen went into a grove of trees to relieve himself and this is when he stumbled upon the decomposed remains of a toddler which as i'm sure you can guess is in fact baby charles the skull was badly fractured and there were indications of a hasty burial baby charles's nurse betty gow had the unfortunate task of identifying baby charles which she positively did she was able to identify him because he had overlapping toes on his right foot and he was found wearing a shirt that she had made for him. Due to the skull fracture, it appears that baby Charles died from a very bad blow to the head. Now this next part I can find a little bit suspicious, but the Lindberghs decided to cremate baby Charles, which is not out of the ordinary. A lot of people cremate their kids, their family members, loved ones, whatever, but they did it very, very quickly. It was just the day after baby Charles had been found that the family already had him cremated, so. Before he was cremated, though, a coroner did examine him, and it was determined that baby Charles had been dead for about two months, which puts his death around the time of his kidnapping, and that, in fact, his death was caused by a blow to the head. By June, officials began to really speculate that the kidnapping and subsequent murder had, in fact, been committed by somebody that the family knew, and suspicion quickly fell upon one Violet Sharp. She was British, and she was a household servant in the home of Ann Lindbergh's mother. When Violet was initially interviewed by police, she gave contradicting information about where she was the night baby Charles was kidnapped. So quickly suspicion fell upon her once they realized she didn't really have a solid alibi. Police also thought she appeared unsuspicious when she was questioned. Then on June 10th, Violet Sharp committed suicide by ingesting silver polish, which contained cyanide. And this was just before she was about to be questioned for the fourth time. So obviously suspicion has really fallen upon her. Police probably think they've got their woman at this point. However, her alibi was later confirmed and police were very criticized for how heavy-handed they went at Violet Sharp and I think a lot of people probably believed they were the cause of her suicide at that point, so. Dr. Condon was also looked at as a suspect. Police searched his home, but nothing was found. And during the time where Dr. Condon was a suspect, Charles Lindbergh stood completely by Dr. Condon's side and he never once suspected his friend of having anything to do with his child's kidnapping and subsequent murder. Speaking of Dr. Condon, he did his own unofficial investigation after they found baby Charles's body. To the public, Dr. Condon became enemy number one. But behind the scenes, Dr. Condon made a pledge to find Cemetery John. And he went to every police department he could, looking for any clues to lead him to Cemetery John. But having exhausted all theories at this point, investigators came to a standstill. With little evidence and no new developments, police turned their attention to tra tracking that ransom money. They prepared a pamphlet with all the serial numbers on the ransom bills, and 250,000 copies were distributed to businesses, mainly in New York City. A few of the bills did appear at scattered locations, with some of them even showing up as far away as Chicago and Minneapolis, but they were never able to figure out who was spending those bills. My theory as to how some of them ended up in Chicago and Minneapolis is that maybe they had been spent, like, right after the ransom was received and maybe before those 
pamphlets with the serial numbers were sent out and that they just ended up getting circulated into the system and they weren't discovered until they made their way to Chicago and Minneapolis. That's just my theory. Let me know what you think in the comments. And then on May 1st, 1933, a presidential order was made that all gold certificates should be turned in and exchanged for other bills. A few days before the deadline, a man brought $2,980 to a Manhattan bank for exchange. It was later realized that the bills were from the ransom. The man had given his name as J.J. Faulkner of 537 West 149th Street, but no one named Faulkner lived at that address, and a woman named Jane Faulkner, who had lived there approximately 20 years before, denied any involvement. Then during a 30-month period, a number of the ransom bills were being spent throughout New York City. Detectives quickly realized that Okay, well, apparently not quickly because it took them 30 months, but eventually detectives realized that many of the bills were being spent along a route of the Lexington Avenue subway, which connected the Bronx with the east side of Manhattan, including the German-Austrian neighborhood of Yorkville. So if you remember from earlier, it is believed that the ransom note was written by somebody who spoke German as their first language. Finally, it seems police are on to something here. On September 18th, 1934, a Manhattan bank teller noticed a gold certificate from the ransom. A New York license plate number had been penciled in the bill's margin, which allowed it to be traced to a nearby gas station. It turns out the gas station manager had wrote down the license plate number because his customer was acting suspicious. He thought it was possibly counterfeit. It turns out that the license plate number he wrote down belonged to a sedan owned by a man named Richard Hopman of the Bronx, who was an immigrant with a criminal record in Germany. All right, so it seems like we're definitely onto something. It seems like this could be our guy, right? Police quickly move in and arrest Richard, who was at the time of his arrest carrying a single $20 gold certificate and $14,000 of the ransom money was found in his garage. He was arrested, interrogated, and beaten at least once throughout the following day and night. When asked where he got the money, how he got the money, Richard stated that it had been left behind by a friend and former business partner, Isidore Fish. Conveniently for Richard, Isidore had died on March 29th, 1934, shortly after his return to Germany. Richard claimed that Isidore had asked him to store the shoebox for him and that he only learned of its contents after Isidore's death. He claimed that he kept the money because Isidore owed him some from a business deal and he consistently denied any connection or knowledge of baby Charles's kidnapping and death. But when police searched Richard's home, they found a considerable amount of evidence that linked him to the crime aside from the money. They found a notebook that contained a sketch of the ladder similar to that that was left behind at the Lindbergh home. They also found Dr. John Condon's phone number and address written on a closet wall. But probably the most important piece of evidence aside from the ransom money that they found was a section of wood discovered in the attic and after it was examined by experts it was determined to be an exact match of the wood used to create the latter found at the scene of the crime. Richard was indicted in the Bronx on September 24th, 1934 for extorting the $50,000 ransom from Charles. Two weeks later on October 8th, Richard was indicted in New Jersey for the murder of Charles Augustus Lindbergh Jr. Richard faced charges of capital murder and his trial was held at the Hunterdon County Courthouse in Flemington, New Jersey. The presiding judge was Thomas Whitaker Trenchard and just like with the Lindbergh estate, reporters quickly stormed the town of Flemington, New Jersey, and it was soon dubbed the Trial of the Century. In exchange for the rights to publish Richard's story in their newspaper, Edward J. Riley was hired by the New York Daily Mirror to serve as Richard's attorney. Evidence against Richard included that $20,000 ransom and testimony alleging that his handwriting and spelling were similar to those in the ransom notes. In fact, eight handwriting experts, including Albert Sherman Osborne, who is considered the father of question document examination,
contamination in North America. They pointed out similarities between the ransom notes and Richard's writing. The defense called an expert to rebut this evidence, while two others they called declined to testify. The two that declined, it turns out they wanted $500 in exchange for their testimony before they would even take a look at the notes. Other experts retained by the defense were never called to testify. The state then introduced a photograph demonstrating that part of the wood from the mad ladder, Jesus, I cannot talk today, from the ladder did in fact match a plank from Richard's attic's floor. They showed that the type of wood was the same, the direction of the tree growth was the same, the milling pattern, the inside and outside surface of the wood, and the grain on both sides were identical. They also noted four oddly placed nail holes from the ladder lined up with nail holes in Richard's attic's floor. So... Clearly, this wood did in fact come from Richard's attic. Now, about having Dr. Condon's phone number and address, Richard tried to explain it away. Basically, Richard's story is, I don't know how it got there. He must have just happened to write it down. I don't know. Don't look at me. I'm just innocent. I, I just happened to have the go-between's name and address and phone number and I just happened to have the same type of wood in my attic and I just happened to come upon the ransom money but I didn't do it. On top of all of that, Richard didn't have any obvious source of income, yet he bought a $400 radio, which equates to approximately just over $7,500 now, so that is a very expensive radio. He also sent his wife on a trip to Germany, so how are you going to explain that, Richard? And on top of that, Dr. Condon did identify Richard as being the man who arrived for the ransom money. Other witnesses testified that it was in fact Richard who had spent some of those gold certificates and that he was seen in the area of the estate on the day of the kidnapping. There was also testimony that Richard had not shown up for work on the day that the ransom was paid. Then he quit his job just two days after that. Richard never got another job after that and he continued to live comfortably. In Richard's testimony, of course he denied being guilty, once again insisting that the box of gold certificates had been left behind by Isidore Fish. Richard claimed that one day he just happened to remember that Isidore had left the shoebox behind, which Richard had stored on the top shelf of his kitchen in the broom closet. He claims he later discovered, well after Isidore's death, that there was in fact $40,000 in this box. He claimed that that because Isidore had owed him $7,500. He just decided to keep the money for himself and he had been living off of it, he claims, since January of 1934. The defense then called Richard's wife, Anna, to corroborate the story about Isidore Fish. But on cross-examination, she admitted that apron on a high hook right near that shoebox every single day and she does not remember there being a shoebox up there. Witnesses later testified that Isidore could not have been at the scene of the crime the day baby Charles was kidnapped and that when he died of tuber tuberculosis, he had no money for treatment. So if he was in fact the one who got the ransom money, why wouldn't he have taken it with him to Germany where nobody would know he was spending it and he could have gotten treatment and maybe not have died? So clearly Richard's story has just completely unraveled. In fact, Isidore's landlady testified that he could barely afford the $3.50 weekly renting of his room. In the end, Richard was found guilty and quickly sentenced to death. At the time in New Jersey, the highest court that you could appeal to was the New Jersey Court of Errors and Appeals. Richard's attorney appealed and on June 29th, 1935, they argued that appeal. And then on the evening of October 16th, the New Jersey governor secretly visited Richard in his cell. He was accompanied by a stenographer who sp spoke fluent German. Following this visit, the governor urged the members of the Court of Error and Appeals to visit Richard as well. In late January of 1936, the governor declared that he held no position on the guilt or innocence of Richard, but he cited evidence that the crime was not a one-person job, and he directed that they continue to do a thorough and impartial investigation in an effort to bring all parties to justice. And then on March 27th, it became known to the press that 
the governor was considering a second reprieve of Richard's death sentence because it had already been delayed once due to the appeal process. So the governor is now trying to delay Richard's death once again. I think it kind of seems like the governor and Richard have become fast pals, if you ask me. The governor was even seeking out options, looking to see if it was even possible. To looking, He was trying to find out, basically, if he even had the power to issue this second delay. So, on March 30th, 1936, Richard's second and final appeal, asking for clemency from the New Jersey Board of Pardons, was denied. The governor later announced that this decision would be the final legal action in the case. But there ended up being a second reprievement basically because the Mercer County Grand Jury was investigating the confessions made by Trenton, New Jersey attorney Paul Wendell. It turns out that Paul had confessed to the kidnapping and everything of a baby Charles, but it was actually just a hoax. So when that conclusion was made, Richard's final stay ended. Richard actually ended up turning down a large offer from the Hearst newspaper who was asking for his confession. He was also offered a commute from a death sentence to a life sentence in exchange for his confession. Richard denied that as well. And on April 3rd, 1936, Richard's sentence was carried out through electrocution. But just because Richard's dead does not by any means mean that this story has come to an end. After he died, many reporters and indep independent investigators brought forth a lot of questions about the way in which the investigation was run, the fairness of his trial, including questions of witness tampering and planted evidence. We'll get to that in a minute. Twice in the 1980s, Richard Hopman's wife, Anna, sued the state of New Jersey for what she believed was unjust execution of her husband. The suits were dismissed on unknown grounds, though. In fact, Anna kept on fighting to clear her husband's name until her death at the age of 95 in 1994. So just like a lot of cases out there, there are alternate theories for this case as well. A lot of people believe, and I'm gonna agree with this myself, there was inadequate police work at the crime scene. And then also... Charles Lindbergh himself interfered a lot with the investigation. Plus all that on top of Richard's ineffective counsel and the we weakness of witnesses and physical evidence. Like I said, a lot of people question whether or not Richard actually committed this crime. In particular, a man named Ludovic Kennedy questioned much of the evidence himself, such as where the ladder came from and the testimony of many of the witnesses, like I've stated. The most popular alternative theory is that Charles Lundberg himself killed baby Charles either on accident or on purpose, or at least for the kidnapping. Maybe not so much he didn't want him to die, but wanted him to disappear, and you'll see why in a second. So it's believed that due to this reason, Charles arranged to have his son kidnapped, but secretly he wanted him to be moved to Germany, where he would then be raised not by his parents. Another theory is that Charles may have accidentally killed his son in like a prank gone wrong. Some people think that maybe he built the ladder that was found and climbed up the ladder and he was like, oh, look at me, son. Like, come look, I, I built this cool ladder. Come check it out. And that maybe he fell because the ladder did break. My theory is that baby Charles did in fact die when the ladder broke. I think that whoever was carrying him down, whether you believe it's Richard or Charles, when they were going down the ladder, it broke and they fell and the baby hit his head and just died on impact. They then just tried to bury the baby in the woods. Some people believe Charles did it and then blamed Richard. I don't see how he would have been able to do that though because it's just the fact that the wood for the ladder is a perfect match to the wood in the attic at Richard's house. That is a piece of evidence that like it completes this case for me. If, if they didn't have that one piece of evidence, I might believe that Charles was the one guilty here, 
but I don't know. That's just the one piece of evidence that I think really points to Richard. I don't understand how Charles would have been able to foresee that unless it was the case where Charles was just trying to get rid of his son then maybe he did there's a I don't know my my other theory is that if Charles in fact did want to get rid of baby Charles maybe and he was gonna send him to Germany maybe Richard was like his go-between there so maybe he had hired Richard to come and kidnap his son and maybe Richard actually did like when the ladder broke Maybe baby Charles fell and died and then he was probably already going to leave the ransom note and everything. So I think that's a very good possibility as to what could have happened here. Let me know what your thoughts are on this case in the comments, who you think did it, what your theory is there. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Also, don't forget to let me know what else you'd like to hear me talk about. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye!